Hello, I'm Jill Morricone, and I just want to welcome you to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. I love this time as we share, open up the Word of God and share with you at home. This lesson is Understanding Human Nature. I want to introduce our family, your family, to you right now. To my left, Pastor Ryan Day. So glad to have you here, brother. Amen. Always a blessing to be a part of the panel. And I have Monday's lesson entitled, The Soul Who Sins Shall Die. Mm. Okay, to your left, Pastor James Rafferty, delighted you're here as well. Good to be here, Jill. I have Tuesday's lesson, which is entitled, The Spirit Returns to God. Wow, I think we're going to be studying some about the state of the dead. To your left, Shelley Quinn, and glad you're here too. So glad to be here. Mine is the dead know nada. Well, actually it says the dead know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, nada, nothing, it's the same thing. And last but not least, Pastor John Denzi. So glad you're here too, brother. It's a blessing to be here. I have Thursdays resting with the forefathers. Mm. Before we go any further in this study, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. And Pastor Johnny, would you pray for us? Let us pray together. Our wonderful and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. We depend on you, Lord. Mm. We ask for your Holy Spirit that you will speak through us. Give us the words to speak. Enlighten our minds. And we pray that your Holy Spirit will also impress your children all over the world that will be listening to this, that they will also understand and see the light of the truth of the Holy Scriptures. We ask you in Jesus' name, amen. 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 On this week, we study the antithesis, antithetical statements, the contrasting statements between what God's Word says you shall die. That's in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. If you eat of this fruit, you shall die. And Satan's counterfeit uh, doctrine, belief, promise, you shall not surely die. We saw that inherent in the Garden of Eden, and we see it extended all the way down through the end of time, all the way down through our day today. These warring opinions, beliefs, one based on the Word of God. God's Word says, you shall die. This is the belief that the soul is not naturally immortal, mm -hmm. and that death is, as it were, in unconscious sleep. Not meaning we're literally sleeping, but that we are unconscious, knowing nothing until the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Many of the reformers, as we studied last week, held to this, including Martin Luther and John Wycliffe and William Tyndale and some of the Anabaptists. And then we see Satan's counterfeit promise there, the doctrine of the immortality of the soul or that when the physical body dies, what we would term death, the spiritual soul somehow lives on throughout eternity. Mm -hmm. This week we study the Old Testament definition of human nature and the condition of human beings at death. And as you heard from the introduction, each one of our family here is going to be taking a little different piece of that mm -hmm. and unpacking that for you today. Our memory text is Genesis 2 verse 7. Let's read that. Genesis 2 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, nefesh. And man became a living soul. That's mm -hmm. where nefesh comes in. The breath of life is just ruach. That's right. the breath. But man became a living soul, that mm. nefesh. The combination of the body plus the breath equaling a living soul. Mm -hmm. On Sunday's lesson, we take a look at a living being. And it's really talking about the definition of human nature and human life. And the lesson does a contrast between animals and and humans. So let's look at that. We look at the similarities and then the differences. We look at the similarities. Both have life, do they not? Animals have life. That's right. And humanity has life as well. Both were made by God. Mm -hmm. Genesis 1, 24 and 25. This is talking about the creation of the animals. Genesis 1, 24 and 25. God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. Now, interesting, keep this in mind. We're going to look at this when we look at the differences coming later. That animals were created after their kind. Did you notice that? It says after its kind. Keep that in the back of your mind. Mm -hmm. Verse 25. 
And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So we know clearly from this that God created the animals. God made them. They came, they did not come from some um, slime or primordial pit. They did mm. not evolve. God created and right. it was so. We also see that God made man and woman. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. God said, let us make man in our image. Now remember the animals were created after its kind. Mm -hmm. You and I are created in the image of God. We'll get to that a little later when we talk about the differences. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps in the earth. So God created them. I love that word, Pastor Ryan, create. Mm -hmm. Bara in right. the Hebrew. And it literally means to create something from nothing. That's right. Mm. Only God, and it's used in the Hebrew, only when God is the subject. Mm -hmm. So God created Adam and Eve in the beginning from nothing. Mm -hmm. Wow, God created man in his own image. Now I know that he formed man of the dust of the ground, so you could say it came from earth, I know that. But still, God created out of literally nothing. You and I couldn't form something and then all of a sudden breathe and, oh yeah, there's a human being. No, that would never happen. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So both animals and humans have life. Both are made by God. Both came actually from the earth. Genesis 1, 24 said, the earth bring forth the living creature. And then of course we know that Adam was formed, Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Now let's look at some of those differences. And we already alluded to this. The animals were created after its kind, after their kind, the cattle after their kind, the creeping things after their kind. But yet man, humanity, we were created in the image of God. Mm. I love that. Mm -hmm. The other thing I like about this is that we see the plurality of the Godhead here at creation. Let us, not me, mm -hmm. let us create in our, not my image, but our image. We see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, this plurality of the Godhead. Mm -hmm. And male and female, he created them. And I believe that shows especially, humanity is not only created in the image of God, but the characteristics, the character, the qualities of the man and of the woman combined more clearly represent the character of God. Not just the man, not just the woman, but together represent more clearly the image of God. And we were created with the capacity, the ability to choose. Pastor James talked about this in our first lesson and others have talked about that as well. The ability to choose. Only man was given free will. Animals weren't given free will, were they? They operate by instinct, mm. but humanity, we were given free will. We were given the opportunity to choose. In Genesis 2, 16 and 17, what did God tell Adam and Eve? Of every tree you can eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, do not eat of that lest you die. So there we see this um, ability given to make a choice. I can eat of all these other thousand trees, as Ryan talked about, there in the Garden of Eden. Or I can make a choice to step outside of God's will and eat of this tree which God has forbidden. We're all given the capacity to choose. We're all given the capacity to love. And it was love, God's love, God is love, who gave us the capacity to choose. We're given the capacity for growth. Adam and Eve were created with infinite capacity to grow intellectually morally, spiritually, physically, emotionally, created with the capacity to grow, created to reflect Christ, the image of Christ to others. Let's also look at some of those differences. Another difference we see is that humanity was given dominion. Mm -hmm. 
We already read that in Genesis 1, 26, that Adam was to have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, the cattle and the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So first we were created in his image, then given dominion. I think image is essential to function. Humanity needs to be in the image of God in order to function within the realm of dominion. Humanity was formed, here's another difference, from the dust of the ground. And the Lord God formed man. This is Genesis 2, 7. We already referenced it. Formed man. God stooped and formed man himself. That, you know, when I read the Word of God, there's always certain times, certain things that right. I'd like to be present for. Mm -hmm. You know, Absolutely. just like, oh, wow, God, I'd really like to see that. <laughs> Creation of man is one. You know, I just, I would love to see the creator of the universe. God, God is omnipotent and omniscient and all power. He can do anything. And yet he stoops down and begins to form out of the dust, the first man. And then he leans down and he goes, and instantly the body and the breath and man became a living soul. I just... I'd have loved to have been there. Mm. That's just amazing. Mm. So humanity received the breath of life from God himself. So let's look as a recap, the key elements of human nature. One, created in the image of God. Two, given the capacity to love. Three, given the capacity to choose. That's called free will. We can choose to follow God or we can make a choice in the other direction. Four, given the capacity to reason. Five, given the capacity to create. Six, given the capacity to grow. Seven, given the dominion over the earth. Now we know when Adam and Eve sinned, that dominion that was given to Adam was wrested from their control mm -hmm. and it was turned over to the enemy. It was turned over to the serpent or mm -hmm. Satan. But Jesus on the cross, you can read about that in John 12, about Jesus being lifted up and the prince of this world, that's Satan, mm -hmm. being cast out. And at that moment, he bought back humanity, but he also took that dominion, as it were, of the world back under his control. And we also see another key element of human nature is that the physical body, plus the breath of God, the breath of life, that equals life. That equals a living soul. The soul and the breath do not exist apart from God. We do not, and when the breath is gone, it doesn't continue on as we're gonna study. It does not continue on and in some sort of immortal soul. We cease to exist. I'm so grateful mm -hmm. that our Father loved us and that he created yes. us in his image to love him mm -hmm. and to love other people. Amen. Thank you so much, Jill. And I'm with you. I, I would love to be able to see Jesus recreate or to create a human being. But yet, I love the beautiful promise we have in the book of Revelation that it says there shall be a new heaven and yes. a new earth. And we will be there to be able to see Jesus yeah, recreate the new heaven and the new earth. I'm excited about that. My name is Ryan Day. I have Monday's lesson entitled, The Soul Who Sins Shall Die. Of course, this is uh, taken directly from Ezekiel chapter 18. And we'll get there in just a moment. But I have to set this up because because as I was studying for this lesson, I was reminded of my many travels across this country. And, you know, I love um, as I'm traveling from, you know, state to state, city to city, I love to look at the church signs. You know how people, you know, they'll, they'll put the little messages in the church signs. And some of them are, you know, can be a little funny or, you know, some of them can be really serious in nature. But I'll never forget one day I was driving by a church in my home state of Arkansas and it, the message on the sign caught my eye. And, and it, this, this is what it said. It said, you will live forever. The question is where? Mm. And so we've already covered in this series so far, in this study series so far, that uh, we obviously know that it's, the Bible does not teach the concept of an immortal soul. But yet that's what this particular church and, and we have to say that the vast majority of Christianity today, especially evangelical Christianity, believes in this concept of the immortality of the soul, which we know is not biblical. But I'm just bringing that out there because that caught my attention. That there's so many people that have this idea that the soul is some type of, you know, invisible, translucent substance within our body that is liberated from the body at the point of death. And so the idea is when a person dies, their body dies, but yet their soul that has, you know, conscious awareness and intelligence and goes on again to 
live in the eternal presence of God or in the eternal presence of either some type of purgatory or eternal hell. We know that that is not biblical. I remember when I preached my mother's uh, funeral, I, 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 I conduct, conducted the, the sermon for my mother's funeral, and I took that opportunity to preach that truth on how we do not have a mortal soul, but rather my mother is in the grave sleeping. You know, metaphorically, she's unconscious. She's awaiting the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But I still had people come up to me afterwards and shake my hand and hug my neck and said, oh, your mother's in a better place. You know, she's with Jesus. And communicating that concept that, again, she has an immortal soul. Her soul cannot die. Mm. My friends, this lesson number three, the soul who sins shall die. We have to deal with that text. If, mm -hmm. if it is truthful that a soul can't die, but it lives forever, well then what do we do? How do, what do we do with when we get to Ezekiel chapter 18 mm -hmm. verses 4 and 20, which says, notice this, Ezekiel 18 verse 4 and verse 20, behold, all souls are mine. I love that. God says, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. And here it is, the soul who sins shall die. Shall die. Mm. But wait a second, I thought a soul couldn't die. Mm. Well, the Bible clearly tells us that the soul can die, which clarifies, which we've already covered here very clearly and probably will hear multiple more times. And that is that the soul is a combination, according to Genesis 2, 7, mm -hmm. of the body and the spirit. The, soul, the Bible never once refers to a dead soul. In other words, the only kind of soul that there is is a living soul in the sense that obviously when you get the book of Revelation, it says that the dead stand before the great white throne judgment. But yet even that is a spiritual death that it's mentioning there. They're still very much resurrected and in their living state uh, for, so they can receive the judgment. But there's no such thing as a dead soul in the sense that, you know, a, there's a, a living dead person. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Mm -hmm. But yet the Bible Definitely. only talks about a living soul. That's the only kind of soul there is, a living soul. And so he even repeats repeats it in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. Again, he says, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father and the father uh, be shall the father bear the guilt of the son. The uh, righteous of the righteous shall be upon himself and the wickedness of the wickedness shall be upon himself. So the soul who sins shall die. Even Jesus communicated this very clearly uh, in a roundabout way in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, which tends to be a controversial text to some people, especially when we're talking about the unconsciousness of, of you know, of death, you know, a person sleeping in the grave unconsciously and awaiting the resurrection. This idea that, not, you know, there's not an intelligent, uh, aware spirit that's returning or some type of ghostly figure that's returning to the Lord mm -hmm. at the point of death. People struggle with that and they'll often go to Matthew 10 verse 28 to try to prove that. Mm -hmm. Notice what Jesus says here in this text. Matthew chapter 10 verse 28. He says, and do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the Okay, it seems like he's making a differentiation here, but we'll, go, we'll, we'll, we'll clarify it. It says, but rather fear, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So what is Jesus saying here? Mm -hmm. He's making a differentiation between the temporary and the et eternal. Mm -hmm. It is very truthful that yes, the righteous can possibly perish in this life. Mm -hmm. But yet we have the beautiful promise that Jesus says, even though your body, uh, you know, you may expire for a time, if you believe in him, this is uh, John chapter 11, verse 25, that I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may, uh, though he may die, yet shall he live. Mm -hmm. This is the promise that even though your body may die in this lifetime, don't fear those who are able to kill the body because your eternal fate, your soul, your very existence, your living, your, I don't know if that's a word, livingness, your very livingness <laughs> is tied up in me. Jesus says, I hold that power. And so the concept of the, the death of the body and the death of the soul, this is, this is the temporary versus the eternal. Jesus is saying here, that in, in, in the fact that he alone, and, and this is what Revelation 1 verse 18 tells us, mm -hmm. I am he who lives, Jesus says, uh, and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen. And I love this, it says, and I have the keys of Hades and of death. Of course, the King James Version says of hell and death. It's talking about the grave mm -hmm. and death. Only Jesus has the keys of life and death. Mm -hmm. And so he's saying, I, I hold your fate, your eternal fate in my hands. Don't worry about those who can kill your body because I hold the, the, the power to kill your entire existence or to destroy your entire existence in the sense that if you do not, if we do not surrender our lives to him and serve him, then the wages of sin is 
the second death. Mm. Now, that's an eternal death. We know that that's the case mentioned in Revelation. And so the study brings out that in the sinful world, human life is, very, is a very fragile thing. And nothing uh, infected by sin can be eternal by nature. Mm. And then he goes on to quote Romans chapter 5, verse 12, which actually says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all have sinned. And then, of course, it goes on to say, death is the natural consequence of sin, which affects all life here. And we see this even uh, communicated in Isaiah chapter uh, 40, verses 6 through 8, and also texts like James chapter 4, verse 14. So Isaiah 40, verse 6 and 8, just to reference it here, it says, it says, the voice said, cry out. And he said, what shall I cry? <laughs> he says, all flesh is grass and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass, it says. Mm -hmm. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Yeah. What is our life? Mm -hmm. It's a vapor. It's, what does James 4, 14 say? Whereas, notice, uh, you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? Mm -hmm. It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. This is a fragile thing, my friends. Yeah. And we have to understand that the soul that sins, sin brings condemnation. Sin brings eternal death. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 19 through 20. This is a powerful point because on this matter, there are two important biblical concepts the lesson brings out. One is that humans are no different than the animals, as Jill brought up earlier. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 19 and 20 says, For what happens to the sons of men also happens to animals. Mm -hmm. One thing, notice, befalls them. As one dies, so dies the other. Yeah. Surely they all have one breath. Man has no advantage over animals, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and all, and all return to dust. Again, mm -hmm. con the concept that we are all just like the animals and that we do not have this eternal soul. Uh, you know, the second concept that the lesson brings out is that the physical death of a person implies the cessation of his or her existence mm -hmm. as a living soul. The fact that, you know what, when we die, we cease to exist until God again, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if we're righteous, he breathes that breath of life in us mm -hmm. and he brings that living soul back to life. But when that soul is not living, it ceases to be a living soul. It mm -hmm. ceases to exist, which you know, think about Romans chapter 6, verse 23. It's one of these uh, contrasting, uh, the, the points where it contrasts two different ideas. Mm. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is? Death. Is death, but the gift of God is eternal life uh, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Mm. So get that. Uh, the, uh, the gift of our Lord is eternal life, but what is the reward for living in sin? Death. death. And of course, that's referring to this second death. If you continue to live in sin, then you will suffer an eternal death. The soul that sins, it shall die. It shall die. Even what's that famous verse, John 3, 16? <laughs> uh, you never heard of that verse there, before? Going there, going there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, perish but have everlasting life. Again, that concept that the soul that sins, it shall die. That means the living soul, the only kind of soul, the body, or the, the Bible communicates that soul can indeed die mm -hmm. and can he die, and die eternally if living in a constant state of sin. Mm -hmm. And which hence the reason why Solomon even re repeats it in verse 20 in chapter 18 of Ezekiel when he says again, the soul who sins shall die. Mm -hmm. So this statement has two main implications. One, of course, is that since all human beings are sinners, all of us are under the unavoidable process of aging and dying. And you can read that in Romans chapter 3 verses 9 through 18 and 23. I don't have enough time because my time is getting away from me here. But I just want to bring out here that, it, you know, toward the last part of this verse, it says, in contrast, or the last part of the lesson, excuse me. It says, in contrast, the biblical solution for the dilemma of death is not a bodiless soul migrating either to paradise or into purgatory or even hell. The solution is indeed the final resurrection of those who died in Christ Jesus. Remember, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Mm -hmm. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Amen. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pastor Ryan. The soul that sinneth shall die. Mm -hmm. Great study. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. 
There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our study on understanding human nature. And we'll pass it over to Pastor James Rafferty on Tuesday. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Ryan. Tuesday's lesson is entitled, The Spirit Returns to God. And it's based on Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. And again, we're just kind of rehearsing a little bit of what we've been learning about creation and death being the reversal of creation. Now, there's an illustration that I love as an evangelist to use when I try to simplify this, make it really easy to understand. So I use the illustration of a light, a lamp that gets electricity into a bulb that lights the room. I say, you know, that lamp is like the physical body, right? And the electricity is like the Spirit of God. And the light that is shed when that electricity comes into that lamp is like the soul. So when you turn on the switch, you connect, you, in a sense of death, you resurrect, but you connect that spirit, that electricity with that physical lamp. And when you connect that electricity with that physical lamp, that becomes a light. Mm -hmm. When you switch that switch off, when you turn that switch off, you're disconnecting the electricity from the lamp and the light goes out. Where does the light go? <laughs> Where is it, right? right. It ceases to exist. Yeah. That's right. It ceases to exist. And so we've been talking about this idea of the immortal soul versus the mortal soul. And the Bible, of course, never says that there is an immortal soul. Right. Mm -hmm. And so these verses here are kind of reiterating that. We start with creation in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Again, we're just going to go back to that verse and take a look here. The Lord formed man of the dust of the ground, that's the lamp, that's the physical lamp, and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life, that's the electricity, so God is the electrical plant, he's the power plant, and when the life, the electricity got into the body, the physical lamp, there was a light, there was light that was illuminating, there was the soul, there was life, mm -hmm. and man became a living soul. So the living soul is made up of those two parts. Now, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 reverses all of that for us. Now, Ecclesiastes 12 is really, it's, it's a beautiful picture that we see here in this very poetic um, uh, language about life and about death. Uh, remember now, verse 1 says, The Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble and the strong men shall bow themselves and the grinders cease because they are few. And those that look out of the windows be darkened, verse 4. And the doors shall be shut in the streets when the sound of the grinding is low and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird and all the doors of music shall be brought low. Verse 5, also, when they shall be afraid of that which is high and fear shall be in the way and the almond tree shall flourish and the grasshopper shall be a burden and the desire shall fail because man goeth to his long home and the mourners go about the streets wherever the silver cord be loosed, verse 6, or the golden bowl be broken or the pitcher be broken at the fountain or the wheel be broken at the cistern, then, verse 7, shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. Now, when that spirit returns to God and that dust returns to the ground, what happens to the soul? Well, just like the lamp that is flipped off and the light ceases, it ceases to exist. The soul is the combination of the spirit and the dust. And those two coming together make a soul. Now, that cessation is going to be reversed again at the resurrection. When Jesus Christ comes to resurrect us, he's going to unite again the spirit with the dust. And that reuniting is going to bring forth the soul, renewed, glorified, right? Made immortal by Christ, by the power of God. So just, I love to, to, to talk about this. You know, sometimes we're, we're a little bit nervous to talk about the state of the dead because we think, oh, a lot of people don't see it this way. We talked about a lot of Christians don't see it this way, whatever. Mm -hmm. I love talking about this subject because I was raised Catholic and didn't really understand it then and, and then started going to different churches, different Protestant churches and end up in the Adventist church because to me it made the most sense. I mean, just think about the whole process of um, God's plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you, you know, we're looking at God putting a plan B into place. It wasn't God's will that we sin. It wasn't God's will that we endure pain and suffering, all these things. But he knew it. He understood it. He's omniscient. He knew. And he put a, he put a plan of salvation in place for us. And that plan of salvation could have looked a little bit different. For example, um, God could easily have said, you know what I'm going to do? Um, I'm going to punish the wicked as soon as they die and just be done with them. Right. I'm just, I'm just going to do that. And, uh, and he said, I'm going to reward the righteous as soon as they die, and I'm going to bring them to heaven with me. Right? He could have he done that. But he didn't. Why didn't he do that? Well, I love this because, for one thing, being in heaven with God while you have friends and relatives who continue to suffer on planet Earth is not necessarily the best plan. Mm. Yeah. It's not necessarily the wisest That's plan. For sure. And so God is so wise and he's so loving, he had to come up with another plan that would allow us not to suffer any more than necessary by seeing the suffering of those that we love or continuing generations. And then in addition, bringing justice to a wicked person without allowing those who have been victims of that person to see the justice mm. also wouldn't be a perfect plan. I mean, it doesn't even mesh with our judicial systems today, right? It doesn't line up with our imperfect justice systems of this world. Why? Because they allow victims to have closure. That's what we call mm -hmm. it. We call it closure. In fact, crimes that have no closure, what we call cold cases, right, <laughs> cause people to lose faith and hope in justice altogether. Mm -hmm. So God's plan is even wiser than we could have hoped for. Right. God has set it all up in such a way that really vindicates his character, right? While both the saved and the lost rest in the grave, they have no uh, uh, awareness, they have no consciousness, just like a good night's sleep, you know. For us, the rest is unknown to them. In other words, death is the gateway to the first or second resurrection, right? The next thing the wicked know is justice. The next thing the righteous know is eternal life. That's why God says, I, I mean, Paul says, I don't know if I want to be present with, you know, in the body or, or ask him for the body and present with the Lord. Because he's talking about this spiritual truth, right? right? He's talking about this unconscious state of death. And, you know, I think it's no wonder the devil is trying to twist this teaching, right? Mm. He's trying to distort this understanding of the state of the dead because it reflects directly on the character of God. Mm -hmm. It reflects directly on the Amen. character of God's that's right. love. Yeah. And that's why I love this topic because this topic has brought a lot of peace to my heart. Yes. And I think it brings a lot of peace to other people's hearts when they recognize that God has done, he has the best plan mm -hmm. for this whole sin problem. He has the best plan for our and even those who are lost for all of humanity's Amen. understanding of how to deal with sin and how to deal with suffering. Amen. Yeah, beautiful Amen. teaching. I'm Shelley Quinn and my day is Wednesday. The dead know nothing. I want to begin by reading 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16. 1 Timothy 6:16 6, is talking about the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who alone has immortality. Mm -hmm. Did you get that? Right now, God alone has immortality, and it will be a gift to us, as we've studied in 1 Corinthians 15, when He returns for His people. He gives us immortality. Mm -hmm. How, I, I just take a second. I want to encourage you, or recommend, a book called Hell and Mr. Fudge. It was written by a Church of Christ a theologian, a, a really deep thinker, but he was commissioned to do a study on death. Well, Church of Christ teaches immortality of the soul. So this guy had to come to this, and that's what we do. If you're really a, a good student, you got to get all of that out of your mind and just say, what do the scriptures say? Long story short, what he showed was that the way this idea of immortality of the soul crept into the church. There was a pagan philosopher by the name of Tertullian. He was from Tunisia. He had been a student of Plato, who was a student of Socrates. And there was this pagan philosophy that Socrates and Plato said, hey, the soul is immortal. So when Tertullian came into the Catholic Church, he wrote a book and he brought in this idea of the immortality of the soul. The Bible 
Throughout the Bible, death is referred to symbolically as a sleep. When we look at when uh, Jesus went in Matthew 9.24, Jairus' daughter, Jesus said, she's sleeping. Well, she was dead. He went to resurrect her. Lazarus in John 11, 11 through 14, Jesus told the disciples, our friend Lazarus sleeps, and they're going, oh, hey, he's getting better. <laughs> and then Jesus said, no. He yeah. plainly said, Lazarus is dead. The deacon Stephen, when he was stoned and died in Acts 7, 6, the Bible, Luke wrote, he fell asleep. Mm. So the New Testament is consistent with what the Old Testament says, what the Bible says about what happens when we die. I'm going to quickly go because I want to get to some new verses, but in case you haven't seen previous programs, Ecclesiastes 9.5 says, the living know they'll die, the dead do nothing. Mm -hmm. Ecclesiastes 9.10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for there's no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Psalm 146.4 said, his spirit, his breath of life departs, he returns to the earth, and in that very day, his plans perish. Mm -hmm. Psalm 115, 17 says, The dead don't praise the Lord, right. nor any who go down into silence. So we see here, like sleep, the dead are unconscious. Like sleep, they are resting. Like sleep, they have no thoughts. So this is a state of unconscious sleep. But here's what I want to get to. Job. Hmm. Job lived during the patriarchal period. If you were going to put Job in chronological order, it'd come right after Genesis. He lived before the Exodus, before the Levitical priestly system. He was the priest of his home. But listen to what the patriarch Job has to say. Job 3, 11 through 13. Job says, why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? He is being tormented by Satan. He's, but listen what he says in verse 13. For now, if I died, I would have lain still and been quiet. I would have been asleep. Then I would have been at rest. So in his immense suffering, Job's mind is clouded by despair, and he utters this thought. Oh, why didn't I die when I was born? Because then I'd just be sleeping in the grave. Death seemed desirable to Job mm. because he saw it as a peaceful sleep. Mm -hmm. He would not have been in pain or in, in torment. But get this, and here's how I'm going to have to make the combination. Jesus said Abraham saw his day and rejoiced. I believe that when Abraham saw his day, the religion was oral. I believe that Job heard all about it because listen to what Job says. Job 14 and verse 12. Remember, he's living during the patriarchal period. And Job says... Man lies down and does not rise till the heavens are no more. They will not awake nor be roused from their sleep. But now go on to Job 19, 25. He knows that until the heavens are no more, until Christ comes to get us, we're just going to be sleeping in the grave. Job 19, 25. I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, after I have, the corruption has corrupted, mm -hmm. he said, after my sin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, Amen. whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, mm -hmm. how my heart yearns within me. Mm. So he's saying, I know my Redeemer lives and that 
He's going to come and he's going to get me. In the Hebrew, Redeemer is Goel. It's a kinsman redeemer. It means one who ransoms his relatives, who are somebody who's under slavery or, or th we see this idea developed in uh, Numbers and Ruth and Isaiah. And then we see in Daniel 12 too, Daniel looked at people who were dead as sleeping in the dust of the earth. Mm -hmm. He says, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And then here's something I wanted to point out. We, several people have mentioned uh, John chapter 5 and verse 28 when Jesus said, hey, don't be surprised. The hour's coming when all who are in the graves are going to hear my voice. Some come forward to the resurrection of life, some to the resurrection of condemnation. Several people have mentioned the second death. The, the resurrection of life, these are the ones in 1 Corinthians 15, 53, who put on immortality mm -hmm. at His coming. The resurrection of condemnation doesn't happen for a thousand years. It's a thousand years later, and we refer to it as the second death. You will find that term only in Revelation, but it appears four times in Revelation, two in a positive sense and two in a negative sense. The second death is going to be the perishing. Those, yeah. those who do not participate in the first resurrection, mm -hmm. those whose names are not in the book of the Lamb, they will perish mm -hmm. in the second death. When, when John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him would not perish. The word is utter destruction. Mm -hmm. So He's saying, if you believe in, there's a juxtaposition. Whoever believes in Him will have everlasting life and will not perish. There's only two ways. The way of everlasting life or the way of utter destruction. When God does away with the sin problem, and unfortunately it's His strange act, He has to do away with sinners, mm -hmm. but they will be burned up. Mm -hmm. That we will walk the, on the ashes of the wicked. And this is something that to me, it brought me great peace mm -hmm. as I studied this before I became an Adventist, mm -hmm. when God showed me this and I realized that suffering. God isn't going, if, mm -hmm. if my father wasn't a Christian, that doesn't mean he's gonna live through eternal torment. Mm -hmm. It means he won't have everlasting life, mm -hmm. but God is love. That's right. God wants you to accept his gift of everlasting life. You can trust Him. You can call on the name of the Savior and be saved. Amen. 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 Well, Thursday's part of the lesson is entitled Resting with the Forefathers. My name is John Dinsey, and we are together on Thursday. And this brings out two different ways in which death is expressed in the Old Testament. We are going to go to Genesis chapter 25, verse 8. The lesson brings out the Old Testament expresses uh, one of the ways is found in Genesis 25. Eight. Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good, good old age, an old man full of years and was gathered to his people. So we have here this concept that Abraham was gathered to his people. So the, the concept of being gathered to his people, what does it mean? Does it mean that he joined them in the state of bliss, that he joined them in paradise? <laughs> or does it mean that he was merely in the grave awaiting the resurrection as we have heard? Well, we believe that according to the scriptures, he is awaiting the resurrection. Now notice here in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 3, that brings out what happens to people when they die. It says, this is an evil in all that is done under the sun. Yeah. 
the one thing happens to all, and it's including both good and evil. Truly the hearts of the son of men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. So where did Abraham go when he was gathered to his people? To the dead. The relatives that were dead, he joined them in the same condition. Hmm. And then we have uh, this scripture from Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5, that we have already read uh, and heard. For the living know that they, sh they will die. We all know that we will die. If the Lord tarries, everyone here in my voice will die, either because of some disease or someone kills you, you're maybe in an accident, you may die. But I am glad that through Jesus Christ, the believers can have everlasting life. You know, this whole quarter is, is entitled Everlasting Life. And we're looking at the different aspects of everlasting life. So here we have uh, now Isaiah chapter 38, verse 18 and 19 that I'd like to bring to you. Uh, notice what it says. This is the New King James Version, and I'm going to tell you what it says in the King James Version as well. For Sheol, that is grave in the King James Version, cannot thank you. Why not? It's because the dead know not anything, neither can they do anything. So uh, once again, reading. For Sheol cannot thank you. Death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your truth. Mm. Mm. The living, the living man, he shall praise you. As I do this day, the Father shall make known your truth to the children. So it is while we are alive that we can praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. And there is unfortunately a great misunderstanding in this area. And this is why I'm glad that uh, the quarterly is yes. helping us bring these little details out. Right. Because sometimes, you know, you're doing an evangelistic campaign. You have to dedicate one night to the state of the dead. <laughs> and there are so right. many different things that people have brought up. This lesson is going to be a lesson that's going to clear up a lot of confusion in this area. So the dead cannot praise the Lord, only the living. Mm. So when you die, you are dead. You cannot praise the Lord. Uh, I've, I've recently heard of some people that say that when you die, um, if you've been good, you go to this part of Sheol and the wicked go to another part and there's mm. this separation between them. But the good people are praising the Lord in paradise. And so this is a great mistake because the living only can praise the Lord. This is what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. So let's look at some other scriptures brought out in the lesson. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, mm -hmm. I will set up your seed after you and who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. So there's this idea of rest when you are in the grave. Mm -hmm. Rest means there is no activity going on. Mm -hmm. Rest means that you are not conscious. Mm -hmm. Rest in the concept of death means that you cannot praise the Lord, you cannot enjoy anything, and we have read and heard many times that uh, your thoughts and your plans, they perish. You mm -hmm. cease to exist. That's right. So uh, this is uh, one of the words, rest, it's a great word that has been chosen to help us understand that the dead are rest. And so if somebody tells you, when I die, I'm going to come back and haunt you as a ghost, <laughs> you have nothing to That's worry right. about <laughs> because they cannot come back. They can't do anything to you. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 10. It says, so David rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. So this scripture is significant because uh, notice what the lesson says. What does the fact that both good and bad kings went to the same place at death teach us about the nature of death? Mm -hmm. Both the good and the bad go to the same place. Mm -hmm. That's what the Bible brings out. David rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. Mm -hmm. Question, does the Bible say that David was a good guy or a bad guy? Well, in 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 5, it says, Because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything that he, com that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. So this is, this is the Lord uh, bringing this out. So David is considered a good guy. But where did he go? He rested with his fathers. But let's look at another guy. 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 40. So Ahab rested with his fathers. Then Ahaziah, his son, reigned in his place. 
Well, the question is, was Ahab a good guy or a bad guy? This is what it says in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And where did he go? He rested with his fathers. That's went good. to the same place that David went, rested with his fathers. So they're both going to the same place. Why? Because the Bible establishes that you have to wait for the resurrection, mm -hmm. either for the resurrection of the righteous or the resurrection of the wicked. That's right. So the wicked guy, Ahab, he's going to wait for the resurrection of the unjust, the resurrection of damnation, the resurrection of the wicked. And David, according to the Bible, he is waiting the resurrection of the righteous. Mm -hmm. So praise the Lord for that. Here we go. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 6. It's another guy. So Jehoiakim <laughs> rested with his fathers. Mm -hmm. Then Jehoiachin, his son, reigned in his place. Question, does the Bible say that Jehoiakim was a good guy? or a bad guy. Mm. Here we go. Uh, let's read 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 36 and 37. So Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebuda, the daughter of Pediah of Rumah, verse 37. And he did evil. evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his fathers had done. So where did he go? Mm. He rested mm. with his fathers. They right. go to the mm. same place. So 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 33 says, So Hezekiah rested with his fathers, and they buried him in the upper tombs of the sons of David. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem honored him at his death. Then Manasseh, his son, reigned in his place. One more, one more time. Does the Bible say Hezekiah was a good guy or a bad guy? Well, 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 1 and 2, Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. So we see, again, it brings out these different individuals, whether they were evil or they were good, they both go and rest mm. with their fathers, waiting the resurrection. And I'm reading to you from the lesson. It says, another way of describing death is by stating that someone rested with his forefathers. About King David's death, the Bible says that he rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. The same expression is used about several other Hebrew kings, both faithful kings and unfaithful king. Mm. So I think most of us have heard at one time or another, you know, somebody that may be old, uh, maybe a grandmother, grandfather, and they make some reference. They say, well, I'm tired. Mm. I have lived a long life. Mm. The Lord has been good to me. I will be glad when my time to rest has come. Mm. <laughs> this is an expression that I'm sure you have heard. And so I bring to you Job chapter 14, verse 1 and 2. Notice this. Man who is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. He comes forth like a flower and fades away. He flees like a shadow and does not continue. When you die, you do not continue. You're awaiting mm -hmm. the resurrection. Finally, you've heard this one from Sister Shelley Quinn, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10. Whatever you find, your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Yeah. For there is no work mm -hmm. or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Mm -hmm. The time to praise the Lord is now. Amen. You can only praise the Lord now while you are alive. Unless when you pass away and you are resurrected and you are among the righteous, then you can praise the Lord for <laughs> eternity. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. I love Amen. that. Thank you so much, Pastor Johnny Shanley. Pastor James and Pastor Ryan, thank you for the clarity mm. with which you open up the Word of God and Amen. share. I think it has brought in, um, there's a lot of confusion on the subject mm -hmm. in various churches and we pray as we journey through this quarter that if you're in confusion regarding this subject that it will, the Lord will bring clarity to your mind as well. Mm -hmm. We have a few moments, so give each one of you a Absolutely. You know, time. I wasn't raised a Seventh-day Adventist, mm -hmm. so I was raised to believe in the immortality of the soul and that people go to heaven immediately when they die. But one of the texts that really convinced me when I was studying this early on is when Jesus had the conversation with Martha, the sister of Lazarus, when he came back to resurrect Lazarus. Mm -hmm. She didn't know that yet, and so when Jesus is coming, she says, Oh, Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And then notice what Jesus says to her in verse 23 of John 11. Your brother shall 
Rise again. Rise again. That was a moment where Jesus could have been like, Martha, Martha, hey, look, what are you doing over here? Hey, look, your brother's up there in heaven and glory. How do you, you know, you, he, could, he could have said something like that. Even Martha repeated it in verse 24. It says, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Where was she had gotten an idea of like that? John chapter six, a few chapters before Jesus repeats it four times in the same chapter. And I will raise it up at the last day. I'll raise it up at the last day. So that's just another indication that yes, we do not have an immortal soul. Mm -hmm. We sleep until the resurrection mm -hmm. at the last day. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know, Ryan, I too was raised in a non Adventist uh, church. I was raised a Catholic and John 11 meant a lot to me also. And it was an, right. another part of John 11 that I really liked. You know, d uh, Jesus goes to the gravesite. Mm -hmm. And he asked the people to roll away the stone. Right. And then he prays to the Father. And then he says, and this is in John chapter 11 and verse 43. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come down, come down. What are you doing up there in heaven? Are you having a good time up there? But you need to come down because no. or come up, maybe come up. No. No, no, he says, Lazarus, come forth. Right. And that really opened my eyes. It yeah. really helped me to realize, you know, that a lot of times we say death is part of life, but it isn't really part of life. It's not part of the life that God promised for us. Death is the opposite of life yeah. and God wants to destroy death. In fact, we're told in 1 Corinthians 15, death is an enemy of God and it's the last enemy that God is going to destroy. Amen, amen. 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 I just wanted to point out one thing I think I forgot to say about Job. God instituted the sacrificial system in the garden. When Job came around, he was in the patriarchal period before Abraham. Job knew about the sacrificial system because he sacrificed for his kids every day, mm -hmm. but he knew that his Redeemer lived and he would be resurrected as well as did Abraham. And here's the story, 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so even in Christ all shall be made alive. When? Each one in his order, Christ the first fruits and afterwards those who are Christ at his coming. Amen. 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 I am blessed to know that there is resurrection and life through Jesus Christ. And I encourage you that if you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, do so today. Amen. Amen. What an incredible study. I want to leave you with a verse from John 11 as well. You both referenced John 11. I love that story of Lazarus and his resurrection. Verse 25, Jesus said, mm -hmm. I am the resurrection and yes. the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, though he may have that moment of unconscious state, yet he will live. Yes. We will be resurrected again if we die before the Lord comes. Join us next week as we look at the Old Testament hope and how we can see that even in the Old Testament, there was promise of resurrection.